Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the chairman of the board of the Electronic Retailing Association and CEO of SF Global Sourcing, Mr. Steven Feinberg. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Great Idea Summit 2012. We're very excited to be back in Miami. After all, it was you, the members who asked the board and ERA staff to return the Midwinter Conference to South Beach, and we are here. In fact, this year we reached record-breaking numbers with nearly 900 in attendance. Actually, 872 as of lunchtime. Hearing that figure, it's clear that the ERA members and the industry at large believe the Great Idea Summit is a must-attend event. It's the place where industry leaders exchange ideas, dialogues are formed amid the splendor, beauty, and fiery engine sing singularly to cosmopolitan Miami. Year after year, ERA has renewed its commitment to members to deliver high quality conferences and robust networking opportunities to help foster business development and cultivate business relationships. And the Great Idea Summit is just the beginning of what's happening and shaping up to be a very eventful 2012. On April 20th, the association will host the Hong Kong Seminar where members from throughout the globe will gather to learn more about navigating the business landscape in China and hear from key players in this thriving marketplace. Later in the spring, members will travel to our nation's capital to attend the Government Affairs Fly-In, which takes place May 7th and 8th. Members of the ERA community will have a chance to network with top industry professionals, meet congressional leaders from their geographic areas, and gain a better understanding of the legislative process, how it impacts our industry and your business. However, ERA is more than just conferences. We are an organization that brings timely industry issues to the forefront. One issue that marketers are greatly concerned about is the manufacturing and selling of counterfeit goods. It is for that reason that the association is increasing its attention on this global problem. As a proactive measure, ERA and a group of CEOs have formed a CEO council. The goal of the group is to work collectively to not only confront the counterfeiting problem head on, but also to focus its energy on other critical issues that are significant to our members. One of the most vital member benefits we have is advocacy. ERA's government affairs team works diligently on the industry's behalf to ensure level playing field for direct response marketing. Although 2012 is an election year, rest assured, ERA is on top of any legislative developments such as streamlined sales tax and any new regulatory developments at the Federal Trade Commission. The government affairs team is also cognizant of the potential political climate change in Washington and how it infects the industry's issues. Another value-added member benefit is the fact that ERA is uniquely positioned to convene a dialogue between its members. And we're thrilled that some of our members are taking advantage of it and beginning to bring us these problems directly. We encourage all our members to identify issues that they believe should be addressed more broadly and convey them to myself as chairman, to our board of directors, or and to the ERA staff. Aside from simply picking up the phone or sending email, ERA has actually created an online networking community called My ERA. It's another way the association promotes member participation and interaction. Why do we go to such great lengths to build our own social networking platform? For all the members, business development is paramount, and ERA has always been a facilitator of it. Through my ERA, members can network, share industry knowledge and insight, as well as access educational resources, 
geared towards enhancing their own business practices. I'm a firm believer in gaining knowledge through peer interaction, whether it's social media, one-on-one -on -one exchanges, or panel discussions between industry thought leaders. The objective is always the same, to create meaningful dialogue that can empower others to take action and to affect change. And what better way to illustrate meaningful dialogue than with this year's keynote presentation? It's my sincere pleasure to introduce our moderator, Carla Crawford Kerr, ERA Education Committee Chair and Director of Business Development Relations at Hawthorne Direct. Thank you, Steve. Welcome to the keynote presentation titled DR Disruption, what you need to know about social and over-the-top television. Lately, there's been a lot of buzz swirling about social and over-the-top TV. And today, we want to take a closer look at these two technologies and discuss the impact that they may have in the near future of direct marketing. Joining me on this panel, gentlemen, would you like to come forward? Joining me in this panel discussion are three leading experts on these technologies. To my left, we have Andrew Gordon. Andrew is president and founder of the Direct Impact Group. Brendan Condon, CEO of RevShare, and Ben Mendelson. Ben Mendelson is president of the Interactive Television Alliance. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks. We'd like to start off today by asking Andrew, just what is social TV? Well, social television is really the convergence of television and social media. And it's really driven by viewers connecting to the programs that they're watching, uh, connecting with other viewers who are um, watching those same shows with them, and also connecting with the advertisers that are supporting the shows. Uh, a lot of it is done on second screens, such as tablets, smartphones, and to some degree e-readers and some of the new connected television sets that are social media enabled. Um, it's, it's really an interesting... Uh, Andrew, can you tell us a little bit about what the social TV ecosystem is really looking like today? Okay. Um, can you go to the second... Oh. Well, the, the, this just shows how crowded it is right now. Those are all logos of, of actual apps that are out there right now. Those are just 50. And then Facebook and Twitter have a significant uh, amount of pull in this space as well. How do you... Point this way. Oh, point it that way. Okay. Right. We're having a technical challenge. Uh, <laughs> the social TV ecosystem is really made up of all these, these different types of apps. And in the left-hand corner, you have uh, apps that are done by the, the different uh, cable systems, the MSOs. You've got uh, hardware apps that are done by uh, some of the different uh, you know, television companies that are, that are putting out uh, television to manufacturers. You also have networked. Uh, TV apps from a lot of the different uh, television networks as well as cable. And then you, the, the big thing is, is the third party apps. Um, apps like Into Now, Shazam, um, Connect TV, and Viggle. Um, and those are apps that are what, what are known as ACR, Automatic Content Recognition. So when you're sitting in front of the television set with your iPad or your smartphone, uh, it will actually recognize what is going on on the TV and you will be synced up with that content. Okay, so why is social TV so disruptive and how is it affecting DRTV? Um, well, it's, it's very disruptive in that people are sitting there with these second screens and not all of them are um, participating in social TV. How do you do this again? <laughs> Andrew actually needs his son here to explain this to him. Andrew actually told me that his son taught him how OTT works originally. Yeah. 
I, I was down in the basement one day, and he was watching TV through, uh, you know, watching some some television content through, uh, you know, his Xbox. I was like blown away. That was that was a while ago, though. But anyway, getting getting back to how people um, watch TV with these second screens. There's there's three types of screens. There's tablets, smartphones, and e-readers. And if you take a look at the daily usage of tablets with television viewership, that's at 42%, that's huge. Smartphones at 40%, and the e-readers right now, in terms of the e-readers that are out there, are, are only small at about 14%, because a lot of them were only originally designed for people to read books, magazines, and newspapers. Some of the new e-readers that are coming out are gonna rival some of the same functionality as, as tablets. So, um, why is it disruptive? Because not everybody's doing social, social television. If you take a look at what people are doing while watching TV, they're checking email, uh, they're surfing the net, um, they're checking other social sites that they're involved in. But interestingly enough, 19% uh, looked up a product online with their second screen that they're viewing with with television and so that shows that there's a real connection here in what's going on now even as disruptive as this technology can be it could also enhance the television experience for a lot of drtv uh, advertisers because we can use social media ratings um, to with nielsen and combine them and actually understand sentiment of shows. Um, we can also use some of these apps that have the ACR technology that I was just talking about. I think eventually we will be, as direct response advertisers, we'll be able to use the second screens as response mechanisms where people can actually see what's on the TV, watch the commercial, their second screen will then sync up with that commercial and provide them with either a landing page or um, you know, an, uh, some way of, of connecting with the advertiser. Thanks for that vision, Andrew. Um, Brendan, we'd like to get into OTT. Just what is over-the-top television? Well, um, I like to simplify things and, and, or distill them as best that I can. And when I think about OTT television, I think of Kermit the Frog. They probably huh? What does that mean? Well, he's had a resurgence lately, right? We've seen him on the Academy Awards, and, and he's very popular. OTT television is, in effect, the ability to leapfrog your cable TV box. So you've got the feeds coming into your house, right up to the wall, jumps right over the cable box, and goes right to your television. That's it in its most simplest form. Brendan, can you talk about the catalysts that are driving the shift towards OTT? Sure. There, there's quite a number of catalysts, and, and I look at them in two ways, and I'm going to share a graphic that may be able to highlight that for you. The players. So if you think about over-the-top television, there are content providers giving us long-form and short-form programming, as well as advertising coming from the likes of Hulu, Netflix, and Amazon.com. There are also the television makers and manufacturers like Apple TV, Google TV, Samsung, and Sony that are providing smart television so they can readily accept those feeds coming from the likes of Netflix, Hulu, and Amazon. And then for those folks and consumers that don't have smart televisions, they can use their regular television, but use the box technology being provided by Roku or Boxy and even your Xbox or PlayStation or Wii station to receive those feeds and view them right on your television. Ben, how is interactive television different from OTT? Well, it Interactive television, it's actually, a, um, if you look at it, interactive television is really sort of the overall um, application, the software. OTT really is the, the over the top, it's really the box and it's, it's the ecosystem. Uh, and the interactive television runs within that ecosystem. So it, it's, if you wanted to think about it, it's, it's sort of the difference between the hardware and the software. And the interactive television is the software. Uh, with that said, um, a lot of, of what we've talked about, because it's, it's sort of in the, in the name of the organization that I run, the Interactive Television Alliance, one of the things that we, we like to uh, focus on is the fact that all of this 
because we tend to get caught up in the talking about technology, when in fact the, the concept of what a television is is really about behavior. And, and when you're, because every device that you're using, whether you're using these devices, whether you're using a connected TV like a, a Samsung that connects to the internet, those devices, it, it depends on the behavior of, of the way that you use it. And, and I think that's important that you, we keep that in mind, that, that it's not about the bells and whistles. Okay. Now, according to a study from IPG Media Labs and you, me, 94% of viewers use some type of companion media while watching TV and online video and tuning out during commercials. What does this shift mean for traditional marketers? Well, it, you know what, it's, it's, we know this, uh, you know, it, it, in an informal way that was always called the TiVo effect. Uh, you know, the fact that uh, um, people are doing something else or they're, they're not watching TV in the same way, uh, particularly, you know, having, uh, you know, ads engaged at real time. Uh, and marketers have had to deal with this a lot over the past three or four years. Um, it, it doesn't, you know what, it, it's, it's not a matter of good or bad, it's sort of the way it is. Um, it's going that direction anyway, because if we take a look at this generationally, uh, um, anybody who's, you know, 30 and under uh, reacts to advertisements different than people of, of our generation would anyway. So I think we need to keep in mind this generational shift. But. Um, the, the, the fact is that marketers are on top of this. Uh, they're, they're reacting to it a lot by um, there's branded uh, programming has become a much bigger important thing so that the, the brand actually becomes part of the programming. That's one of the things they're doing. The other thing is that they're using the, the technologies creatively where, where you can have more of an opt-in uh, experience with the advertisement. So uh, would you say yeah. are brand marketers truly embracing social and OTT and can you provide some examples of su successful campaigns, Andrew and Ben? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, as far as um, social TV goes, a lot of the big brands are involved in it and you've probably s seen them, but you may or may not be aware of them if you're not plugged into the apps, but they were big during the Super Bowl, the Grammys and the Oscars. Um, Coke, Pepsi, The Gap, Old Navy, um, uh, Tide did a very interesting uh, social television commercial in the Oscars the other night uh, for a product called uh, Tide Pods where um, you saw the commercial and then um, there was a little bug in the lower corner telling you, you know, to go to uh, Shazam and then you could actually sign up and get a free sample. And so that's, you know, an interesting way for a brand marketer to use this technology in a direct response method. Excellent. According to data from the Diffusion Group, 106 million households utilized OTT video services in 2010, and that number is expected to increase to 250 million by 2016. Is over-the-top TV a game changer for the direct response television industry, Brendan? Absolutely. You know, size matters. Sorry, guys. It's true. You have to be big. and. This space we see, let me just show you this slide with those numbers, it is growing and it's growing quickly and the penetration to households, you think about 106 million US households, that's 90 plus percent of the reach and it's only getting bigger. And you think about what's happening around the world, it's not US centric, it's a global phenomenon that we have cord cutters and those folks called cord nevers, I don't know if you're familiar with those terms, but imagine your 24 to 54 year olds now buying, you know, first time renters are buying homes. They're not installing telephone lines and they're not installing cable boxes. They're going directly to the television providers like the smart TVs and the content providers like Netflix and YouTube and the like. And they'll continue to do that. And if they do that in a scalable way, which these numbers show, it damn well is a game changer. And we as an industry have to be on top of that. Now, what metrics are in place for OTT? There's a number of metrics, and, and I call it the race to the right, effective CPM or effective metric. You've got Nielsen, you've got Rentrack, you even got the McKinsey Consulting Firm working with those guys, trying to figure out what's the right number. How can I get to that addressable television targeted in a way that I know my audience? For us in this space, in this industry, I say it doesn't really matter. 
It's more about when you have those consumers with that capability right in front of them, with that technology, can you get them to engage? So for me, it's not a CPM, it's a CPA. It's the cost per action is the key metric for us. What is the impact of social TV on TV ratings, Andrew? That's an interesting question because Nielsen just recently came out um, and said that a 9 to 14 percent increase in social television buzz around a program can equate to a 1 percent increase in ratings, which is huge. And so now what's going on, interestingly enough, is some of the producers of some of these shows that want to get renewed are trying to get out there and, and incite some, some social media buzz around their shows because the, you know, a two, the difference between a 2.4 rating and a 2.6 rating um, can certainly get one of these shows uh, renewed. But for, for our purposes, if you take a look at the Nielsen subscriber base, which is about uh, 20,000 people uh, nationally that we get the Nielsen ratings from, in any given hour during 9 to 4, there's anywhere from 25 to 35,000 people tweeting about their shows that they're watching. And we as, as media planners, if we can take some of these social media metrics and integrate them with you know, some of the Nielsen uh, metrics, we might be able to actually increase the effectiveness of our TV buys by anywhere from 5 to 15 percent. So for instance, if you take um, you know, twi a Twitter feed on a show. It's, it's sort of like the heartbeat of the show. It's, it's almost like an EKG. You can see where the show is going. Um, that's one aspect of it. Um, if you take uh, some of the, uh, like, like with some of these shows, um, how many people have watched TV and seen like a, a hashtag at the bottom corner of, of the screen? Well, what that is, is it, it provides you with the actual hashtag to do the tweeting. And um, there are companies out there, um, Social Guide, for instance, uh, you might want to write this down. You can actually go to Social Guide right now, and it will show you, you know, any social buzz happening around all the different television uh, networks as well as the cable networks and we'll show you sentiment and everything but the interesting thing is Nielsen you know with such a small sample size measures the amount of people but with social uh, television metrics we're actually measuring sentiment we're, we're measuring engagement so, so I think that's a little bit more important so if we put all this together we can effectively do much better media planning um, beyond just you know traditional Nielsen measurement what is transmedia and what is the opportunity for the DRTV advertiser? Well, transmedia is, uh, can, can be important to us on several fronts. One is, uh, on the creative front, if you're telling a story in your commercial, whether it be long form or short form, you can actually continue it on a second screen through a social media TV app. Um, from a... Um, a response perspective, you can actually have response mechanisms, uh, you know, built into these uh, social media, social TV apps. I'm sorry, and uh, it's. I, I think that's really going to be the future of response. Excellent. What can direct response marketers learn from their experience, Ben? Well, uh, I, you know, one of the things uh, about the this whole new ecosystem is really the ability to uh, target and track. Um, and I think that, uh, look, the, the direct response industry, all of you guys um, know how important that is, um, especially the tracking portion of it, which obviously DRTV has been actually a pioneer in the, the, in the tracking mechanisms. Um, but the targeting side uh, is, is also very important. And, and the big brands are very focused on this, and I think that's something that the, the DRTV people can uh, learn a lot from, the, these new abilities to, to target people and focus on the demographic that you want and, and essentially be in their lives in a much more opt-in environment or at least creating the feeling that they are, and that's going to become uh, much more important. 
talking implications and opportunities, what is the biggest challenge direct marketers will face with these technologies and what do they need to overcome and to succeed? I'd like to throw this out to all three of you, so. I'll, I'll take a shot at it. I think for all of us as an industry, we have to step up to the plate. We have to be willing to look at our creative and acknowledge, hey, some of this doesn't really work. Or it may work for one device, but it doesn't work for all devices. And that's no longer acceptable. You have to be thinking about when you're doing your creative, does it work for the 55 inch screen? And does it work for the mobile screen and everything in between? Because your consumers now are looking at that creative and the content that is creating that in terms of the programming and they're looking at it across all those devices. The second piece is that with this technology, we're providing consumers with convenience. And I call it scalable convenience. And if these consumers are experiencing this convenience, they will have expectations from us as marketers to be able to supply and deliver whatever we're advertising at that moment in time. So if you're offering a service or product and you're meeting all the criteria on the viewing side of the screen, you better have the infrastructure to support and deliver and fulfill whatever that product and service is 24 seven and do it with quality assurance that these folks are expecting not only from their devices, but from those who advertise on them. I think with um, you know the rise of the connected TVs and where people are gonna be able to watch content streaming from the internet on, on the TV. I think we as marketers need to do a better job with our websites. Uh, I think you, a lot there's going to be a lot of conversion to HTML5 over the next couple of years. Uh, I also think it's important that anything you shoot, whether it's testimonials or you know your commercials or just you know any video content, you better shoot it in HD because people are going to be watching it on a television, not necessarily on a computer. Um, I also think that you probably need to do some experimentation with some of the ad networks that are serving ads through the connected televisions. Uh, you might want to start downloading some of the social TV apps and start experimenting with them, see what's going on with them. Um, and also, um, I think move some dollars around, uh, you know, in, into connected television media buys uh, to, to see what kind of traction you can get. Because right now, you know, as, as Brandon pointed out, you know, the, the future looks really bright on this, but right now the scale isn't there and it's a good time to do some inexpensive testing for when it does scale. Um, what else? Yeah. Yeah. One word of caution on that as direct markets. If you think of back 15 years or so ago, our industry built the cable industry because brand marketers and advertisers were not interested to lower scale and a security in the programming and content being delivered over cable. Today, they're looking at over the top, they're looking at social television and all these new technologies as brand advertisers and saying, boy, I'm gonna be all over that. And that will make scarcity in the marketplace in terms of advertising inventory that'll become available. And if we're not in there with great creative competing for those airtimes, we will not get the volume and skill that we're looking for. Yeah, and I, I want to concur with what both of you said, but particularly I do think, and I, don't, I know some of you know that um, 12 years ago I was uh, uh, Vice President of Internet Development for the Electronic Retailing Association, so I, I can sort of see some of you uh, over those 12 years and how things have evolved. And I think that, you know, over those 12 years, there, there have been some advancements in terms of everybody having a website, being able to do some stuff. But um, the, it's very challenging to get, to, to move to do something that, that is disruptive because uh, it takes time, it costs money, there needs to be a commitment. Uh, there needs to be mo money made. Uh, I think all of those things can happen and, and should happen and will happen. I don't think we're gonna have a choice because it Again, I go back to the question about generations. Uh, we're still selling primarily to uh, you know, a, a 40 and over crowd. Uh, if we want to get new business, we need to be there. We have to be in social television. We have to be uh, knowledgeable about the opportunities in the, in the over the top 
uh, in the new, new connected TVs. Um, so I think it's it's only a plus, uh, but it's a matter of actually doing it. I think the ERA has an important role in, in promoting and in, in making the knowledge accessible so that you can do it. But I think we you all have to do it. So. The, the other thing is, again, integrating that uh, social television metric with the traditional Nielsen metric. There's three companies out there right now that are doing social television research. Uh, one's called Trender. Uh, there's another one called Social Guide that I mentioned. And the third one is Bluefin Labs. And I think it's really important to understand engagement because that's what it's all about. Um, where traditional you know, Nielsen ra ratings are just about regular measurement of about how many people. But with engagement, you can see their sentiment, you can see why they're watching different things, you can follow what they're saying in terms of, of Twitter feeds um, and some of the chat rooms that are on the, the social TV apps. Uh, you can also, um, I think one of the holy grails with uh, television DRTV Creative is, you know, we test and we find that things work. And sometimes we think we know why things work, and sometimes we don't know why things don't work. But if you put a Twitter hashtag at the bottom of your commercial and let people who are viewing your commercial start tweeting about it and telling you what they like about it, what they don't like about it, that could really help creatives with better executions in terms of what they're trying to do. What would you say the greatest misperception is on social and OTT right now? It's all 12 year olds. I, you know, I'm one of those victims we were talking earlier before the session in terms of the demographic audience of those who are Twittering and those that are living on Facebook and thinking, oh, it's all those teenagers and it's mostly girls. That's not the case whatsoever. If you think of the sporting events and the male demographics and the affluence that goes with those demographics, tweeting and engaging favorably and negatively about what they're watching. So you're right. If you put a hashtag on there, boy, you better have good creative because you will not survive bad creative, which will go viral and will ruin your brand. So spend the time, the energy, and the effort in doing something special because when you do, it'll be viral in a very successful way. What is your overall message to advertisers and marketers that are here right now on social and OTT? What message do you want to tell these marketers who are saying, ah, social, OTT, you know, what they were saying about the uh, web not too long ago? Yeah, well, you know what, it's, it's, it, it's don't be complacent. Um, the fact of the matter is, um, the, every time you hear news, like uh, the past couple of days, there's been a lot of news because Canoe sort of dropped out of uh, their commitment to interactive television, so it sounds like, oh, it's not I, here. I think you should explain what Canoe is. Oh, yes. I probably should. Uh, C Canoe is a, a consortium that was put together by the major cable companies, similar to the, how they did cable apps. So the major cable companies got together, put a pool of money together, so that they could create a sort of a standard for, um, for interactive television and for uh, interactive advertising through all cable companies, which is a very big challenging thing to do because all the cable companies have different technologies and different head ends. So it's, uh, um, but the fact of the matter is, is that interactive television and the interactive advertising can be done throughout the system anyway. There doesn't need to be a uniform system to do that. So that's one of the problems is that the, there's sort of the message out there, oh my god, it's not ready yet. It is ready. We've been ready for, we've been ready since, uh, you know, all of the analog signals have been turned off and everything's digital. Because at that point, everybody had some capability of receiving uh, digital television and interactive television. So it's in the home and it's, it's easy to become complacent about it because it's like, oh, I can do that later. The fact is, is that you, you can't do it later. You really need to do it now because, um, especially from the DRTV industry, uh, I always had a sense that um, there's this great opportunity to uh, where DRTV can be selling not just small products, you know, uh, locally, uh, but can be really used by the large brands. And either the DRTV 
as, a, as, a, as an industry is going to move up to that because they really know it better than the, the, than the general brands do and the general advertising agencies do. Or the agencies are going to learn how to do it and sort of take over that territory. So I think if the future of, of this group, this organization, is going to be bright, it's going to be because we're going to actually have examples of people taking advantage of technology and, and just, you know, doing it. We're going to go ahead and open it up to the audience. So if you have any questions that you would like to ask our leading experts here, um, please just raise your hand and Vi will bring you a microphone. Um, I was wondering, There we go. There we go. Uh, can you give me an example of uh, using any product in the direct marketing mix here? ShamWow, SlapChop. Give me an example of over-the-top TV and then one with social media as a fully integrated concept. Yeah, I can give you an example. Uh, unfortunately, the marketer has asked not to disclose, <laughs> but I will tell you, it's a financial service provider in the insurance industry who is looking to engage with consumers and have them literally register through their television for price points on different insurance policies. So they're doing their traditional branding, they're doing their traditional DRTV, and hoping people will respond through 800 numbers and unique URLs and the like, but they're also having creative produce that enables them to have consumers literally go right to the landing pages through their television. There's um, a, a social television app called Zbox, which has not come to the United States yet. It's in Great Britain right now. And they are actually um, going with all kinds of advertisers and they, through this ACR technology that I was talking about before, they are actually doing um, an, an interactive response mechanism through uh, the television app. And uh, sometime by the end of this year, that particular application will be available here in the United States. And that's something that we should all watch for because uh, what they're doing in, in England is just incredible. Yeah, I can say that um, as far as our community here, uh, I don't know of anybody who's been playing in this area, or if they have, they've been sort of doing it secretly. Um, but the large brands all are, are very active in this area. Uh, I can tell you that uh, Coca-Cola is hugely active. The, the, uh, um, the, the largest in terms of numbers of, of members, the, the largest uh, non-celebrity um, page on Facebook is Coca-Cola. And uh, they've been using that in, in all different ways, uh, both through the social network, but they're also starting to delve into uh, video. Uh, and, and they're getting into like little snippets of branded video that has some sort of interactive content and has some capability of being able to uh, sign people up for things, to send them information, uh, and to, to send them coupons. So I can tell you Coca-Cola, Procter & Gamble, uh, most of the major brands, um, you know, I see them at, at all the shows, and they've been very um, uh, helpful to us at the ITA. So, uh, you know, I can say categorically there's a lot of stuff happening from the major brand side. Vi, Natalie Hale had a question. On one point, you were talking about how everyone's got their iPhone on with them while they're watching TV. They're going to the website right away. On, wouldn't you say that it's really important that your website is mobile enhanced? Yeah, with yes. HTML5, that would do it. Absolutely. And, you know, we talked a little bit about this is where you have to rise to the challenge. If you're going to do creative that's going to drive traffic to your web, boy, you better have a good website. And it has to have that multi-platform capability. Do we have additional questions? Rick Petrie. So I'll paint a picture for you in the Petrie household that I think is pretty typical. Family of four sits down to watch Modern Family, daughters 9 and 12. I'm dinking around on my laptop. My nine-year-old has got uh, my wife's uh, uh, tablet. Uh, the 12 year old is looking at her smartphone and my wife is completely and utterly exasperated by all of us because no one's paying attention to the show. 
But what occurs to me is that everyone is really narrow casting their own stream of consciousness. It's about what's relevant to each individual. So when you think of that in the context of what you guys are talking about in the future of advertising, where do you see this in five years or ten years? Where do you think this is headed? And what is a marketer to do? <laughs> that is so scary. Five years, ten years, that's, that, that's like... Two years. Thing. Yeah, two years. Seems yeah, you like... guys are going on record here, so be brave. Yeah, yeah. I, I know they always ask what things are going to look like five years from now. It would be very interesting to look five years ago what people were saying. So it's very scary. Um, you're absolutely right. Rick, it's the same thing in my house. It's like everybody's doing everything, and, and they're actually not even necessarily watching the show. But um, it's called for media multitasking, yeah, uh, media it, mashing. If that that is the thing, the thing is, if you if you want to get to the nine and twelve year olds who are going to become twenty two and, and twenty five year olds eventually, uh, they're going to carry that behavior, you know, forward. So five years from now, when when your kids are fourteen and and you know. Uh, 18, whatever the 14 and 17, um, you know they will. This will be an integrated part part of their their lives. As a matter of fact, if you take a look at, at the the growth of Facebook, um, Facebook has essentially become an operating system. It is Windows for the the for the internet essentially, um, and and we have to understand that that five a few years from now. Um, you know, if, if Facebook doesn't completely blow it, or if the government doesn't stop them from getting any bigger uh, and control it, um, there will be this social platform that every part of our lives, whether it's television watching, uh, you know, whether it's shopping, uh, whether it's doing any sort of recreation, will there will be some social media component to it. Yeah, I also think of it um, in terms of personal navigation. So your viewing habits will be unique to you, regardless of the device you're in. And your household, you'll be watching four different versions of an old-fashioned TV guide. And it's what you've customized for when you want to watch it. The key for us as direct marketers is to get in with that content, whether you do it through product placement or you do it with adjacent advertising that's relevant to the consumer at that particular time. So there'll be an incredible amount of fragmentation in the marketplace, but I think that's okay if you're very good about how you target your product or service to correspond with that content. I think there's going to be some consolidation also between all these uh, different social television apps because it's just, it's the wild west out there and there's so many of them and when you're viewing, you know, do you want to be on an app that's going to give you rewards for watching programs and, and commercials? Do you want to be an app, on an app that, you know, checks you in to a chat room so you can talk to other people? I mean, there's all these different kinds of apps and, and the VC market is funding all of these very aggressively. But I think there's going to be some consolidation and, you know, that picture I showed you before with the 50 apps, um, that'll probably end up shrinking down to maybe a handful. Um, but I think the other thing that we have to recognize is that the biggest threat to, to television really is probably Facebook and Twitter. Um, Twitter is, has the potential to become a broadcast platform and Facebook already is a broadcast platform. So, you know, we as, we as advertisers and marketers have to kind of take a look at that and see how we can leverage those things to get ROI out of them alongside of, you know, some of the more traditional buying that we're doing. Question in the front by. Over here. Um, oh, sorry. The, the, the question was, what about radio, right? <laughs> What's radio? <laughs> No, I think if you, even with the advancements of drive time and all the equipments that come with your, your latest car versions, people will still be listening to the radio and hopefully keeping their eyes on the road. So there is that, you know, audible, literally, capability of having good DR creative that enables that consumer to say, wow, I, I hear that, I'm going to engage with it. Not immediately, but, at, you know, in the subsequent time frame. Question about about the relevance of, of DRTV advertising. The picture you paint tells me that the, the real action right now and in the foreseeable future is going to be programming that's talked about and 
is excitable on things like Twitter and Facebook and things of that nature. You know, a Jersey Shore, a Mad Men, Modern Family, things of that nature. Most DRTV advertisers buy remnant advertising on the stuff that's not going to be Twittered and Facebooked. Does that put us in a position of being second-class citizens on getting on the bandwagon with this stuff? We're not, we're not in a position to be engaging people in Modern Family. No, that, that's actually not true at all. Um, if you take a look at uh, Social Guide and take a look at the Twitter feeds, and they have uh, 114 uh, broadcasts that they simultaneously uh, monitor, you know, all the, the uh, social buzz around. And, you know, a lot of the shows that, that are in the rotations that we're buying are specific shows that you might be buying in daytime, you know, such as reruns of Law & Order, people are tweeting about them. And, you know, there's, you know, anywhere from, from 2 to 4% of, of the Twitter activity during that hour is relegated to some of those shows. So you can actually gauge the sentiment and see what's going on and what kind of engagement there is around those shows. How about, how about standalone half-hour infomercials? The only way to do that is if you put hashtags in them. Yeah, I think it it's, uh, deals with, um, you know, how you originally initiate uh, you know, with the advertisement, because the traditional way is sort of you're leafing through and you know you're clicking and you happen to find it. Um, I think the the distinctive factor of what's going to happen in the future isn't that the half hour show is not going to go away. It's just that the customer's interaction, original engagement, original interaction with it is going to happen through a hashtag. It's going to happen. It's going to start a different way. And if that infomercial is dynamic and the creative is engaging, people will tune into that just as readily as they would tune into traditional program that we would see today. Content is king. You know, we've said that for 20 years in the media. And whether it's the programming or it's the long form or the short form, what gets people engaged is great content. Wendy Cooper. I'm <laughs> I am. I'm, Maybe I'm, we can help you. I'm just a little bit confused. Okay, so um, the Twitter thing for me is I'm not sure I'm understanding how you really you're monetizing Twitter with DR and the hashtag. I get Twitter, but I have to tell you I have a 21 year old and a 31 year old, and they do not even think twice about Twitter. My 21 year old says, "What? What is that Twitter thing, Mom?" And he's and he is cool. So, but I'm not, I'm not sure, I don't even use Twitter, so I'm not sure I understand how you monetize that. I'm not sure I understand how it, it has anything to do with, I mean, engagement, that's our business. We engage people. We've been engaging people for forever. We know how to engage. So, right, but we wanna, am I the only one that's completely lost as to what, this, we, we what you're be, talking about? We want to be in shows that people are engaged with so they'll become engaged with what so, we're saying in our commercials. So if I'm watching Hulu, which I do all the time, and I'm watching a show that I couldn't watch on television because I'm not going to sit in front of the TV, but I am going to watch Hulu, ABC Go, HBO Go, whatever that might be. This is what we're talking about. This is what we're talking about. This is where the advertisements might well, come up you, and pop could, up and engage people. You could be served an ad through Hulu, sure, you know, and it's, right. it's one and done, and it's it's personally served to you as you right. watch it. So that's a little bit different. Oh, so that isn't what we're talking about. No, it's the, uh, what we're talking about when we say engagement. Traditional DR television engagement is defined by somebody picking up the phone, they're walking away from their television and going into the kitchen, pick up the well, phone, and call. Well, I, 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 I could right? agree with that, but I, I don't necessarily agree with that because now if they're sitting there with their mobile device, whatever that might be, in front of the television set, they can easily see a DR commercial, go to the website, and buy and never leave the room. Correct. So that's the beauty of having media mashing. That's what we were talking about earlier, about multiple viewing devices. But the advancements of television now, you don't need that mobile device to be with you. You can do it right on that singular device. Ben, isn't that yes. what you've been talking about for forever? Oh, yeah. Happening? Yeah, and okay. it's made a great living for me. It's wonderful. And now it's happening in scale. <laughs> so you, there, Thank actually, you for pointing that out. Okay, so there's like, actually something. I'm sitting there in front of my television, and yeah. I don't need to use my mobile device, whatever that mobile device might be. 
if you have a connected television, what are the new but televisions But I have to that have a connected television. That's where I got lost. I'm sorry. Thank you. All right. So yeah. the, the, the smart the TVs. The television manufacturers are coming out with these smart TVs, these connected televisions, which enable you to either through a walled garden or a non-walled garden to actually access content over the internet, such as Hulu, Netflix, um, even you know certain websites from networks where you can actually watch programming, um, you know, from the websites right on your your television. Okay, I think I'll let somebody else ask. <laughs> Any other questions here? Yeah, I think that just epitomizes that this is not simple stuff. There's a lot of complexities and lots of layers. So you're not alone in some of that confusion. And it's only going to get worse. I mean, D DRTV media planning between, you know, tr traditional linear television, you know, the second screen apps, you know, the... Uh, the ad networks through the connected television, the online video, on and on and on. There's so many places where you can get eyeballs to, to sell your products. And it's, it's all about trying to understand where all this is going so you can be on top of it and generate you know, ROI. Because traditional DRTV media planning for linear television within a year or two is going to be obsolete. <laughs> Follow up, follow up question. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, it's just a question. <laughs> right. So what you're really saying is that your overall media budget has to has to be parceled out. You're not going to completely leave the DR television linear world. You're just going to put, apply some to different mediums of media. Right. Te Correct. Television isn't dying, it's evolving. And through through this evolution, it's fragmenting and it's becoming even more complex. So it's No, it's, it's just becoming like better because you have it, it more better. places. Well, well no, it's, it's 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 a better viewer experience, but from a, you know, a, a media buying planning perspective, it's very complex. Yeah. Tim has a question. Is there a microphone? Yeah. So I, I think I think everybody in direct response, I think everybody in advertising has been confused about how Deer TV is going to adapt in an interactive environment. And there are a couple of really serious challenges that I see and I'd love to hear your comments. One is, sure, we can buy media time over the top, Netflix, Hulu, you know, we can buy the, 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 the pre-rolls and the mid-rolls and the post-rolls for short form. You know, how are you going to buy long form in a, in a, um, uh, a non-linear over the top way? Nobody has figured that out and I'd love to hear if anybody has any ideas about that. But one of the primary challenges is that at this point, and I think for the foreseeable future, all of that media is at premium cost. And nobody who's doing ROI advertising can afford it. So nobody's going to be doing pre-roll for a long time until you know, the cost per thousand comes down. So, and that's, that's, that's my experience at this point. So, curious as to your... Yeah, Tim, you know, at RevShare, we live and breathe on PI inventory, whether it's on television or it's in the online space, mobile and radio and the like. And you'd be surprised how much available inventory there is on pre-roll and post-roll online across major portals and publishers that they're not able to monetize on direct CPM basis. And so they'll create the remnant pods and offer it up on a PI basis. So, uh, PI media, you're saying, is going to be available on, for short form. Those PI slots are typically 30 seconds, or can you get 60s and 120s? Yes, you can get 15s, 20s, 30s, 60s, and 120s. Right. And my, my assumption is, is that the number of people that will tolerate watching a 60 or a 90 or a 120 uh, is going to be minimal. Because they're obviously, when they're going to select something in an interactive format, on-demand format, they don't want to watch commercials, they want to watch the programming. Yes and no. So I always go back to two things. If they don't want to watch the commercials, they'll do a premium subscription so they can bypass those. For those that are looking for cost-free viewing, they'll watch the advertising. Will they be happy? Only if the creative is good. It goes back to, if you have incredible 120 creative, it'll go viral. It'll be hashed and tweeted and talked about and more people will be willing to watch it. If it's what we see today, most of it people won't watch. 
Well, that's where the challenge lies in us as an industry, leveraging agencies, leveraging the really creative folks that are out there to raise the bar on that creative delivery. Hey, Tim, the only reason that, that we have, what, 60s and 120s are really to, to tell more of the story and also to make sure we beat the viewers you know, with, with the response mechanism so um, they'll respond. But with online, you don't need longer times because you can have you know, an, an, a back-end response mechanism built right into it where you can just you know, click and there you are. So you know, all the stuff served over the internet, you don't have to go with the longer forms. But you could also you know, stop the programming and go into a VOD kind of situation and, and show a longer form commercial if the person's interested. So I mean, there's a lot of different ways to do it. So, one of the, uh, just one more point here, which is, which is the question that I've been asking myself for 15 years, and that is looking at the future of DRTV, and that is in the future, which I think we're approaching very rapidly, the consumer is going to have more and more control over what they view. That is the whole point of kind of new media. and. In this environment, the problem of ad avoidance is very, very significant. So what's going to happen is, as people have control over what they consume, they will be watching less advertising. This is kind of my point of view on this. I consider this to be a significant challenge to all advertising, but very much so to direct response television. Just curious as to your thoughts. Yeah, well look, um, I do think in, in, in all of our discussions on how the world's going to change, uh, I think in terms of uh, the direct response industry, it's the biggest. It is by far the biggest challenge. I, I absolutely, um, because the the behavior that we've depended on for such a long time um, is is not going to continue. Uh, there, there's not going to be uh, any incentive for uh, younger generations to be interacting with the media the way that they do now. So the rules are changing. And with the change of rules, I mean, I think there does need to be, uh, you know, there needs to be a lot more discussion. You need to write that book, basically, because uh, you're absolutely right. Now, I would actually differ there in terms of think of the consumer of the future. They're going to have an expectation that they can buy that product or service right there while they're watching the programming. And they'll expect to see those types of relevant ads coming to them targeted based on their demographics and their viewing habits. And they'll welcome that if it's good creative. But I also think it won't be in the, in this, the, the way that uh, we, we track and target and buy ads now will not be the same way we, we were going to be buying ads in the future. I think the whole system needs to change. You're right. But uh, I don't think the system can maintain itself the way that we buy and sell ads today. Because of the fragmentation, it's going to mirror what we see with online advertising and the double clicks and the ad techs of the world who are dynamically serving those spots to the publishing sites. We'll see something similar in television, for sure. But also with you know, the new technology and, and the way um, programming will be distributed, a lot of it will come over the net. And with the internet, you have, you know, back channels, you have metrics, you, it's, it's so much more trackable than trying to do things the way we do it now over, say, like a, a, a traditional cable television network. Um, so we're going to just be able to take two more questions now. So then does it actually become more about a different level and type of engagement as opposed to simply, you know, ad aversion and things of that nature? Isn't it more about you know, the type of engagement that's going to happen when it comes to social and interactive TV. Yeah, yeah, it does. And because, you know, we, we speak the language of uh, cost per million CPM and cost per acquisition. And, you know, and, and the fact is the, the, that, that model of metric um, is, is relevant, but that's, I don't think that's how we're going to be buying uh, media because of that. Because we're actually, we're changing the language of, of how we interact with that advertisement. So you're, you're right, that's gonna change. Okay, Rick Petrie has a question in the front. It, it seems to me what we're talking about is a paradigm shift from television advertising is largely an interruptive uh, 
uh, model to one that's participative and uh, if you think about home shopping, that's really what it is, right? It's must-see television for the devotees of HSN and QVC. So I'm wondering, given what we're discussing, all the fragmentation, what kinds of other integrated marketing and promotion can you guys envision that would drive relevancy and identify, you know, find the, the tribal members for these brands and products? I, you know, I can see it happening through content with product placement and being able to literally engage through your remote to click on something that you're seeing on the screen that's part of the programming and that'll leap for you right into a, a mechanism to be able to purchase or get additional information about that product or service. Where does that happen? I get left, whatever it is. Where does that happen? I'm watching. Where is it taking me? Am I now leaving the show that I'm watching? Yes. So the question is, where does that happen? What will happen is, as you click, because you're in an interactive environment, it enables you dynamically to go to the landing page or other engagement devices like fixed programming or content for that marketer, and then you can go back again. Just like you do on the internet when you click on a banner or a button and you go back to the portal page. Yeah, but I'm watching, I'm kind of watching TV. But you're not watching TV like you used to. That's the difference. It's, it's all changing. Everything's evolving here. A lot, a one lot. poor lady in the back here, his hand has been up for... <laughs> okay, Geraldine Newman, one last question. Very, a very quick comment to make on the, the power of creative, as you've been saying. And that is, um, after the Super Bowl, or even before the Super Bowl, they actually offer to the viewer to watch the great commercials for the Super Bowl. And people go on to it like great programming. So that's the power of great creative. It pulls people, it's magnetic. You know, it's funny you should say that. I was invited to a, one of these fancy Super Bowl parties and thought, I don't want to go to that because everyone's going to be talking while the commercials are on. And they're only going to stop talking while the game's on. I want to watch the commercials too. And so I turned it down and watched the, the commercials and, of course, the game. They actually offer it, like on AOL. Uh, you go on and it says, you know, click here for the, to see the commercials from the Super Bowl. So it's programming of its own when it's great. Absolutely. There you go. Well, thank you to our panelists and thank, thank you. you to our audience for such a lively discussion today. We also want to thank Dave Martin and Vi Panic who work with me on education with the Electronic Retailing Association and they are superstars. Thank you all. We now get to have a little cocktail reception thanks to Dial 800.